Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. This is your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. Today, I'm here with Matt Clark. Matt, how are we doing? Doing amazing, brother. Thank you for having me on today. Yes, I'm excited because you, you know, what you do is really help other entrepreneurs. Uh, and so we're going to kind of talk about that. But first, give us a little background. Who is Matt Clark? Where do you want me to start? Like that is a loaded <laughs> question. Okay. <laughs> How far back do we want to go? Let's with start this at the anyway? beginning. Let's start at the beginning of Matt's entrepreneurial journey. What what were you doing? So, you know, I, I kind of I'm not I'm one of not one of these people who when they grow up, they know exactly what they want out of life and they go and get it. You know. I was always kind of like, I don't know what I want to be when I grow up. I don't know where I'm going. I don't know what's gonna happen, but you know. I'm curious, so let's go figure it out. And that's kind of what I've taken through with me uh, through my entire journey. So, you know, when I finished school, I was like, the first thing is, well, what the hell am I going to do now? Let's go be a waiter. Started with that, figured out, okay, well, I'm really good with people. And then my dad was like, well, you know, you're going to be the first one in the family to go to university. And I was like, yeah, I think you're barking up the wrong tree here, buddy. Uh, I hated school. I just got out of school. I'm not going back <laughs> for another four years. It's just it's not going to happen. So instead, what I did was I went over to the UK and I got a job there with one of the family friends uh, and it was supposed to be installing Sky TV, like satellite TV. And that lasted about a week. I looked at this five in the morning till 10 p.m. at night in the freezing cold. And I'm like, nah, this is not exciting. So I took the next best thing, which was door to door sales. <laughs> Everybody loves the door to door salesman. <laughs> Love it. Uh huh. Everyone loves a door-to-door -door salesman. So that was kind of the basis for everything that that I've done. And, you know, I, I actually really excelled at it. I loved it. We did really, really well. I uh, did that for a year, then went back to South Africa and then uh, was working for one of my dad's friends selling corporate clothing and gifts. Like that was not something I enjoyed in the slightest. <laughs> and then one of my, my, the guy who used to be the manager in, in the door-to-door -door sales company phoned me up. He phoned me on a Tuesday and he's like, Matt, I got this thing I've just started. We're selling telephone systems to businesses door-to-door. -door. Easiest thing I've ever done. You got to come and do it. I was like, oh, thank the Lord because I need to get out of what I'm doing right now. So he phoned me on the Tuesday. I quit on the Wednesday. I was in Cape Town on the Thursday. Met up in this little garage inside of a, a warehouse inside an industrial area in Cape Town. And I'm looking at this, we're sitting on these white plastic chairs and I'm like, where is this thing going? <laughs> Turns out we blew this thing up. Um, we opened up offices all around the country and then I landed up starting my own business with two partners. We took that to 6 million a year within four years. And uh, I sold my shares in that business. And then I started in the online world. I was looking for something that could give me freedom, you know, something that could give me more fulfillment. Uh, something where I wasn't earning South African rands, but I could start earning dollars and pounds and euros, you know, currency that actually makes some sense in the world. <laughs> and so uh, I started off as a, an Infusionsoft certified partner. That was like the first entry into it because I looked at, you know, what it does. I'm like, are you kidding me? We can take a sales process that I used to do manually door to door, put it all online and automate most of it. I mean, this is like pff, every business needs this. And so as we started diving into that, helping businesses do that, we realized that, okay, you can automate the process, but now you've got to feed the beast, right? Everyone needs leads now. And I don't know, I couldn't figure out Facebook advertising. I couldn't figure out YouTube. And so one of my friends was doing LinkedIn and she was like, you got to check this thing out, man. It's amazing. And I realized for me, it was like virtually knocking doors. I could do it from anywhere in the world. I could skip the gatekeeper, skip the red tape, speak directly to the decision maker. And as long as everything is positioned properly and, you know, I could get them on a call and, and sign them up. And so we started helping a couple of our clients do that. Uh, I created a course on that. We sold, I don't know, almost 500 courses. Uh, and then we just started going deeper and deeper and deeper. And, you know, now we've kind of built a whole, we've, we've almost circled back where it's like, we built these three areas, which is, how do we generate leads? Number one, then how do we convert those leads in an automated area, which is the sales process? And then how do we scale that, you know, through running webinars and events, 
getting on stage, speaking live, and then finding joint venture partners, people that can promote you to their audiences or speak on their stages or whatever it is, and then running ads. And so, you know, now with the event of AI being in there as well, it's just like shorten the cycle even further to everything. So we've dived deeper into that. And, you know, over the last eight years, we've helped over 1,800 clients in 26 countries. And uh, we're just having a lot of fun. And, you know, our mission is we want our people to have massive impact, exciting growth that they love and, and a lifestyle that that lights them up. You know, folks, I got to tell you what Matt is essentially talking about very organically. Uh, he just essentially defined a sales funnel for you, uh, right? And he's, he's yep. saying, hey, I go to LinkedIn. That's my awareness stage, right? I'm just getting mm -hmm. people aware of the product and I'm trying to convert them. And then once they convert them, now I have their contact information, all that information. Now I send them to the webinar, right? Now I'm trying to make them a loyal consumer of the product, right? Because at the end of the day, you, what you want as a brand, as a, as a company, as an owner, you want a loyal consumer that's so loyal, that's actually going to share your information on social media and other platforms because they found such exactly. a value. Uh, now, you know, it's interesting. You, you, you talked about, you, you kind of, did a lot of different things before the entrepreneurship world. You kind of thought about the corporate world. You thought about working. What was that kind of moment, that that transitionary period that made you feel like, you know what, I can't work for somebody else. I got to do this myself. You know, I've actually never, I've never had a salary before until I owned my own business, right? I've only ever worked on commission only. So no basic, no petrol allowance. Oh, we had a petrol allowance. Um, but no basic, no benefits, no nothing that, you know, everyone expects these days only ever worked on commission. And for me, that was amazing because I've literally got a blank check that I can write every single month. And for me, it kind of just felt like the next natural step. I needed something more, you know, I'm always into personal development. And, you know, when I say to you, I'm like, I kind of don't know. And I still, to some degree, I'm like, I still don't know where this is going, but I'm curious. And so it's just kind of like pulling at the threads and, and following where it takes me and to see where it goes. But, you know, I've done a lot of work internally, uh, you know, personal development, spiritual development, health, fitness, like all of it. Like it's all, you, you can't just have one piece of the puzzle. Like you need all the pieces to be successful. And so, you know, I think when you start going down that journey of having that curiosity, just that question of like, well, what else is there? leads you down a path and and that's kind of what it took me and i was looking at what i was doing and i'm like asking myself the question like am i truly loving this am i feeling fulfilled by this yes i'm making a lot of money but do i love what i'm doing and the answer was no um in fact it was quite the opposite i felt like it was sucking my soul <laughs> and so yeah it's like golden handcuffs you know making tons of money but I, I couldn't travel and traveling is one of my highest values i mean i've been to I think we worked, I worked out there, they're like 52 countries now. Um, you know, my wife and I have been traveling for the past two and a half years. We're in Vietnam at the moment. Um, and we've been to 27 countries in two and a half years. I couldn't do that before. I had sales, massive sales teams and offices and staff and blah, all this stuff. So you kind of get the golden handcuffs and there's no fulfillment or no reward other than make money and then find the fulfillment somewhere else. And I was like, well, I want to bring these two together. So I went looking and, you know, here we are today. <laughs> and, and still gotta, evolving and still asking what else. I know. And I got to tell you, I, I feel like I'm in the exact same situation. and got the golden handcuffs. As, as a lot of people know, I work my full-time careers in the healthcare industry. I do have a pension, right? Um, and so now as I begin to look at entrepreneurial endeavors and what I want to do, I got about eight years left in my healthcare career. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm always thinking, well, I got that pension, but then I'm also thinking, well, what is the true lifetime value of that pension? And so then I'm exactly. starting to think like, okay, well, I just... I, and I know this, I'm saying I just have to make it, folks, this is in fact, yes, a lot of money, but at the same time, I think when you think of a business perspective and where I'm trying to go, I don't think this is very much. And so when I think of my lifetime value of my purse pension, it's $4.5 million. So mm -hmm. I essentially now have to go out and figure out a way, I, how can I find uh, or earn uh, in a different career path that much funding? Because that's what that was, that will be the shortfall I need to cover. 
Um, mm-hmm. now, what Matt is also trying to say, and I, I truly believe this is as well, is I love my job. I love it. It makes money. I make great money. But I've been trying to find passion in other areas. Uh, this podcast mm-hmm. is one. The nonprofit Latino founders we started. The newsletters, right? Um, networking with people. Though that's my passion, connecting and, and building mm. and helping coach uh, entrepreneurs to success has been my passion. And so now I'm starting to feel this tear between yep. here's this the corporate world that's paying the bills versus the passion that could possibly expand into something else. Now, how did you, you know, because I think entrepreneurs, you have to have a bit of a risk tolerance. How did yeah. you finally decide to say, you know what, this is this is. This is the journey I'm supposed to be on. And what ultimately made you decide that? You know, I, I think it comes back down to never earning, never having earned a salary before. So, you know, what's the risk? If I don't sell, I don't eat. Um, what's the difference? Uh, so it's just like, okay, there's a bit more responsibility in terms of now you've got to think differently because, you know, if you want to be successful as a business owner, you're not, you know, you've know, you got more responsibility than just yourself. You want to build a team. You want to build a business that runs without you. You want to think about things a lot differently. So um, the risk isn't different, uh, in, in at least for me anyways. Um, the risk wasn't different. It was, you know, more rather. It wasn't more. It was just different. Um, and so what I needed to do was understand, well, who do I need to become in order to make this thing a reality? You know, you just start asking different questions of that. Uh so, you know, and, and we work with a lot of people who actually come from corporate and they want to get into coaching or consulting or whatever it is. And they're looking at, you know, their first goal is, well, I'm making 20 grand a month here and this pays for a nice lifestyle, but I work my butt off, you know, 20 to 30 grand a month, I work my butt off. How do I do that in, how do I now go and build a business that can replace that income as the first goal, as the first milestone? How do I get making money first? Then how do we get it to replace the income? And then how do we build a business out of that? And so it's just a bit of a journey. And and I think that, you know, if if someone is like you asking these kind of questions inside of a corporate environment, thinking, well, I'm not going to get rid of this thing that's that's working for me right now and gives me the lifestyle and I can take care of my family and I got that security. If you're used to that, it is a big shift for you. I wasn't used to that. I was always like, you don't sell, you don't eat. but if it's somebody that's got security looking to go into the entrepreneurship world, it's always a, a case of, you know, go and start something on the side in your, in your spare time, go and build that up, go and make a bit of extra cash. And when you get that to a stage of 50% of what you're earning right now, then you can stop doing what you're doing. Because if you're doing 50% of what you're doing right now in terms of revenue and you're working on it a third of the time, well, now if you've got, three times more time, you can get that revenue up there a hell of a lot faster. Yes, that is very true. And I I like that um, concept of, you know, waiting until you have 50% of that, your current salary before you take that transition. Having a runway is is so important. Transition. Yeah, the transition is very important. That's the key. You know, when you, when you've started to build up your entrepreneurial journey, have you, Mm -hmm. did you work with any mentors that you kind of, you know, tagged onto, or have you just kind of learned it as you went? Uh, there've been tons, uh, so many along the way. And, you know, there's, I think that you learn just as much from people of what not to do uh, <laughs> as for also, <laughs> as also from people. I mean, we've invested probably over $300,000 in our own education and over the years. And, you know, some of the investments that we made were, there was this big promise of what you're going to get. And we asked specifically are we getting this, 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 and like line items? And they're like, yes. Okay, cool. Pay the money. Very excited. Get in something completely different. And, um, you know, we get in and we start working and it's like, ah, it's not quite what we got. But then we learned the valuable lesson we got out there was what not to do and how to make our stuff 10 times better to solve the problems of those. And then very often what would happen is that the people that we'd engage with in that group would then come and work with us because we've solved those problems. So I'm always a big believer in, in turn the, the obstacles or the failings or the wrong choices or whatever it is into opportunities. And there's always opportunities around. 
Yes. You know, that's a, I think, I think that's the best way to define an entrepreneur's mind is they don't see a problem as a problem. They see it as a business opportunity. Right. And, it, mm -hmm. and there's, there's business opportunities everywhere. Um, in fact, everywhere. There's, there's old saying, you know, if there's blood on the streets, buy real estate. Right. And, and essentially <laughs> exactly. you know, what, what they're meaning is, is when there's conflict mm -hmm. and there's, there's um, the pandemic is a great example. The amount of individuals that started small businesses or, or side hustles during the pandemic is astronomical. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's to yep. the point where we're actually seeing a limited amount of professionals in other industries because so many people have been starting their own entrepreneurial endeavors. Uh, and so it's, it's exactly. really interesting because um, you see people, they have the motivation to do it and they're kind of going up there and doing it. Now let's, and, and one of the things you kind of do is, is really help these people through that process. So let's talk about your current job uh, or your current business, Virtual mm -hmm. Edge. Tell us a little about it yep. and what does it do? So we uh, work with B2B service providers and we help them to generate their ideal clients, to close more of them and to scale it. Um, as part of that, uh, we help them get really clear on who is the ideal client that they should be targeting based on their skill set, what they've got to be able to bring to the market. We help them get real clarity around the, the message, the positioning that they put into the market and how to actually attract these people in and then validate it, which is the most important part piece of the puzzle. I see so many people get these wonderful ideas. They go and build this thing, put it out in the marketplace and no one wants it. We're very big on let's validate it first and then you can start going out and, uh, and, and getting it wider and then building the things, you know, building whatever course program, process, service, whatever it is. And how you validate it is by going in and interviewing people and figuring it out. And we've built a whole AI tool that does what we, we call it an ask interview. And we built a whole AI tool that does like a virtual ask interview taken through, you know, thousands of, uh, thousands of responses around the internet. And so this helps get a lot of clarity. So that clarity is really the first step. The second piece is getting the offer defined. So what are you going to sell? How are you going to deliver it? Right. Then it's creating what we call a signature solution. So a visual roadmap of how you get your client from point A to point B makes your sales easier. It determines your delivery model um, and it makes your marketing just a breeze. It's wonderful. Like the signature solution is the game changer for our clients. Yeah. And then now we turn the lead flow on, right? Because we've got now an offer date, a validated offer message positioning. We've got a couple of clients on board. Now you turn the leads on. Right. And then once the leads start coming in, how do we convert those leads into conversations, into sales? And then how do we scale it through either running your own webinars and driving traffic to those webinars? Um, or, uh, you know, if you want to start talking on stages live, then you can you know invite people to that. Then finding partners that have your ideal clients as part of your network to to deliver that and, and to get you in front of their network and then running LinkedIn ads. So depending on what stage people come to us, if they're starting out there and then that validating stage, they need to get clarity and they need to get validation. That's the most important step. Clarity, validation, and an offer. Those are the, the, the most important steps before you even get leads. Um, because at, you know, the funny thing is, is as you're doing that validation you, and the clarity, you're going to generate leads anyways, because you're going to be talking to people. So, if somebody's already got their message dialed in, they've got, you know, case studies of clients that have got results, they've got an offer that they know works, then generally what we need to do is turn up the leads and then dial in their sales process. And then if they've got, you know, that dialed in and they've got a team and they've got their foundational elements of lead systems and sales system dialed in and they want to scale it, then we show them how to drive traffic to webinars, how to you better utilize their team. So turn their salespeople from, order takers into deal makers, right? So they go out and actually find it. I mean, uh, one of our clients uh, gave us 10 of his salespeople and I went and spent a couple of days with them and trained them up. And literally the week after I was there, they tripled their sales. Wow. It was nuts. So that's how fast you can move. Depends what level of business that you're at, you're, you know, and how hungry you are is going to depend on how fast you move.
you know, this is really quite incredible because essentially what you've created was a digital service to kind of get you through the stage gate process of product development, but whether it's an idea or a product. So uh, essentially what Matt's saying, you get your minimal viable product out there, right? He's talking about uh, exactly the one thing, what's your thought or idea? And then discovery stage, go out, talk to interview people. Does it make, do I have a market? Does, do I have a product market fit for my minimal viable product? Okay. And then exactly. if, as Matt was saying, if people are willing, they have one, first and foremost, they have to trust you and they have to believe that you're providing value to them in order for them to actually reach in their back pocket and open up that wall, uh, that pocketbook, you know? And mm -hmm. so, but, but then once you start to get a few people that are interested, as Matt's saying, that's really when the magic starts to happen because um, that's when you start going to the trade shows, the Saturday markets, the conferences, talking about your product, speaking about it because you are, uh, you know, a subject matter expert in this field uh, because you are the one creating it. Uh, and so, folks, that is exactly how you should be thinking about when any business that you're thinking about, what is your minimal viable product? Get out there, ask people if they like it or not. That's your discovery stage. And if you get people enough, they like it that are willing to pay for it. Now you have product market fit. But it's also important when you're going through that discovery stage, and Matt uh, highlighted this as well, understanding who your target audience is and really getting down to um, the age group. Uh, if they work in a corporate state, are they more industrial people? Are they farmers? Uh, are they do they rural individuals? Are they you know metro individuals? You know, getting down to that will also you know the riches are in the niches, and so being able to narrow down your market, um, so you're you're doing a little bit better or focusing specifically on the individuals that again will uh, purchase your product is very important. But more importantly, when you're asking folks, don't just ask mom. Don't just ask your friends, you know, make sure you ask people that are going to give you true advice uh, because the last thing we want to see is an entrepreneur spinning their wheels on an idea that doesn't have an actual product market fit, but they believe it does because family and friends can kind of continue to encourage that. So how do you kind of get, you know, you've probably, you work with a lot of entrepreneurs and sometimes maybe they don't have that product market fit. What are some of the areas that entrepreneurs should be thinking about to get to that realization? Either, yes, I do have this product market fit or I don't. Yep, 100%. Great question. And, you know, this is something we deal with all the time and and we, we get it in, in a, it shows up in a couple of different ways. One of the ways is I don't have anything I'm looking to get started, right? Another way is... I'm starting a new business in a new niche and I don't quite know the target audience just yet. And I don't know how to position this thing. Right. Um, another way is I'm completely switching what I'm doing. Right. And all of them kind of fall under the same area because essentially you're taking a new direction. So instead of saying I'm starting a new business or, you know, uh, getting into business for the first time or whatever it is, you're taking a new direction for what you're doing. And if it is different to what you're doing, if there's a different target audience, there's, you know, even if you, even if it's a new product to a different audience under the same banner, the first step is to do that market research, right? Figure out what are the pain points. So you, if you take a look at what are the skill sets that you can do and figure out, well, if I had to go and, and who am I targeting first? Because if we have to target a, uh, a, a let's say, a, I don't know, a nurse, right? As an example, and we have to target a CEO. Those are going to be two very different messages with very different pain points. And we want to understand what are their pains? What are their fears? What are their goals? What are their desires? Right? We call this the 4P framework. So pain, panic, pleasure, and purpose. Understanding that, and then your entire message is going to be, how do we get you from the pain to the pleasure? How do we get you from panic to purpose? Right? And that's where your message lives somewhere in there. And your offer is entirely based around, can you get them there? You know, there's only, there's only three ways to do it, right? Can you make it better than what they're doing, less expensive, or make their lives better? Right? That's so great. can your offer fit within that? If it fits within that, great. Then you know you've got a starting point. Now you go and create your first version of that offer, Right. And even if you're thinking of selling, so what we do with a lot of our clients is they, they'll come in and they'll say, cool, I've got this thing that I've put together. It's I want to charge 
spend five thousand dollars for it, whatever it is. Okay, cool. Have you got any clients yet? Any proof of any proof of concept? Anyone that's paid you for it yet? No. Okay. So step number one is get someone to pay you for it for it. Doesn't matter how much they pay you, right? That's irrelevant. What matters is that they pay you. And so here's a little strategy that is really good for validation, also really good for getting clients to come in. And we call this creating your beta offer. So as an example, if you are wanting to sell this thing for $5,000, um, you're going to go and do some interviews with people, or you're going to find some people that are potentially good fits for your, for your audience. You're going to show them what problem that you solve, make sure that it's a measurable metric, right? Something that's measurable in a fixed time frame. And you say to them, look, I'm charging, I'm going to be charging $5,000 for this. I'm looking for five people in my beta group. I'll be giving it to it at a thousand bucks, right? So 70% off or 60% off, whatever the number is, my brain's not working at the moment. It's 1 a.m. here for me. <laughs> um, so the math is not mathing right now, but you get the picture. Um, <laughs> and so sell it for a thousand bucks. Get those five people in and you, you, it needs to come with some conditions. And the conditions are as follows. Number one is that they realize that this is a beta group and that you will be asking them for constant feedback on how it's going and where you can make improvements that, that you can make better. Number two is that they will give you a video testimonial when they get results. Okay, and they'll talk about it extensively. And number three, they will give you three referrals of people that they think this would be a good fit for as well. So now you've turned your beta offer where you've gone from zero to $5,000 with five clients. You've now turned that into 15 more referrals where even if you bring in 50% of those, so another seven clients and you charge them $2,000, now you've turned zero into five, five into 14, you've made $19,000 and you've got 12 new clients that you can now make a further upsell offer to. Right. So, and that's where you start just building momentum um, and you make your product better so that as you're working your way up to selling it at 5,000, you know, that when you make that off of 5,000, you've got something that's going to deliver the results that you're expecting it to do. You know, and I really love the beta testing idea because what happens with that cohort of beta testers, they kind of become, they kind of feel like they're also part of the game, right? Because it's their Founders. input and thoughts, right? That, that help define or, or construct this software app or, or whatever it might be. And so they become the champions. You know, they, they're, mm -hmm. so we think of that sales funnel again, folks, they're the lowest point on the funnel because they're the loyalist, right? They're the ones mm -hmm. that are able to share and talk about the product. And this is what it's about. And this is how the code is written. And this is how we do it. And this is why it's valuable because they also see the value. In fact, that's one of the things you mentioned. I, Talk about the importance of an entrepreneur to creating value or or uh, essentially highlighting value for their product or service for the client. How important is that? Uh, it's the most important thing. And, you know, we always talk about, especially in your front end message, right? So the first thing that people see is talk about the outcomes that they can experience, right? Choose one outcome. So we call this the power of one. Solve one big problem for one ideal client. Talk about the outcome that they're going to get. Make it measurable. Now, an interesting thing is, you know, we work with a lot of um, business coaches, consultants, and some of the stuff that they do, people come to me sometimes with things that are very difficult to measure, right? It's like an intangible thing that they help with, like leadership, as an example. We work with a lot of leadership executives, or leadership coaches, or executive coaches, uh, or mindset coaches. And it's like, well, how do you make that tangible? Right, because it's not like leads or sales where you can track the numbers and you can say, okay, cool, this is a direct result of these activities. So the trick is to make the intangible tangible. Right, if you can do that, that's where the magic happens. Now the question is how. So what we do is, and and it's actually pretty simple. Most people just don't do it or don't even think to do it. And especially in like the coaching industry where they do these intangible things, they never ask this one question. What was the impact that this had on your business or your life, depending on whatever you're focusing on, what was the impact that this had as a result of this? What improvements did you see and by how much? 
And that starts taking what you're doing, these intangible things and making it really tangible. I, I really like that. And that's what you're then going to sell the you know, tangible I, I, outcomes. That's, that's, I'm, that's a piece. I think a lot of people miss uh, the measurable objectives, measurable goals, uh, cause you mm -hmm. hit it spot on Matt. And like, how do you, how do you define a successful leadership? What, what measure exactly. are you using? Uh, is it the number of people you talk to? Is it the number of phone calls you have? Is it, is it uh, the number of people you hired or fired, right? How do you define a success? Uh, and then uh, to your point, also creating, creating a sense of, so for example, folks, you don't have to use an example in your industry to get your point across about your uh, problem and solution. A great example of this is the AT&T commercial uh, that most recently have, uh, they're on the airlines, they're sitting on the airplane, they're talking about all these hidden fees, like, oh, you have to charge an extra dollar for water on the airplane. And oh, if you want food, well, you can get food, but it's an extra $10 has nothing to do with the telephone, right? But mm -hmm. what the common thing that at t is doing in that marketing is they say, you know what? We are not like airlines. We don't have hidden fees. Everybody knows, everybody's had a flight. Everybody sees the hidden fees. And so essentially they're yeah. like, oh, that's relatable, right? The fees mm -hmm. are measurable and relatable, right? And that's the value, right? Exactly. Uh, we're gonna We're gonna treat you better. You're not gonna have to worry about, that's the value of working with our company. And so, Looking outside of your industry, for examples, to amplify your solution to the problem that you're helping to identify or solve is also really good because, uh, again, it makes it makes it relatable. I always tell, I work in healthcare, I tell my folks, hey, if you're going to do a, a case study and talk about measurable goals, right, it's very difficult to measure success on an educational lecture. Go out, mm -hmm. you do a lecture. Okay, well, how do I measure that success? Well, for me... One, how many individuals attend? Two, I'll give them an evaluation at the end. How did we do? Uh, am I am I clearly or am, did we go off topic? Was there some bias in it? Let us know how we do and give us some recommendations how we can improve. But lastly, the most tangible way I can actually see if these lectures are paying off is the quality of care improvement in the communities that we did the education in. If you're starting to see a decrease in melanoma cases because we did a melanoma lecture in a, a coastal region, oh. that's a high melanoma rate, then you're starting to see it be successful, you know? And, and so it's very important to identify exactly. different, different measurables because they're out there. You just got to find them. You know? 100%. And most people just don't take the time to go in and cover them. They go in and they're like, okay, I've done my job. Check the box onto the next one. Whereas if you go and actually uncover those measurables and you uncover the impact of the work that you've done, not only will you have bragging rights to say, this is what we do, but your clients are also going to see the value of what you do and are going to work with you for longer, right? So you create lifetime value for yourself. You make more money from the same client. The client has more value that's created for them so they have more of the result that they want or in other areas or whatever it is and then together you make a bigger impact in the world yeah yeah what you know one of the things because you work with a lot of clients you, you you're really focused on helping individuals what would you say is one of the most um uh, most common problem that founders either come to you with or tend to run into yeah uh it's interesting Everyone comes to us because they say, I want more leads. Okay. I want to get more of the ideal clients uh, on call. So lead flow, lead, lead quality, lead flow and lead quality, right? That's what they come to. Uh, and then when we dive into it, we uncover the reason of why you don't have the lead flow and the lead quality. And it comes down to exactly what we're discussing. That front end message is not clear. We're not solving a measurable problem in a fixed time frame. Right. And, you know, that is the most common thing that people come to me with. And even companies, I mean, we work with seven and eight figure businesses too. And they come in and they're like, well, we just take on anyone and anyone with a pulse and a wallet uh, is our ideal audience, you know? And then when we start diving deep into it, it gets them so far and then they start hitting a plateau. And then they want to know, how do we take this to the next level? And then when we show them, 
or, or they're doing a lot of activity, which is generating results, but the amount of activity to the amount of results is not weighing up. So they're looking for other options on how to, how to maximize that. And then when we start showing them how to be like laser targeted and how to get bridge that gap between the message and the ideal clients and showing them how to get what they want, then like the example that I gave you, they tripled their sales in a week, right? It, it flies. Um, you know, I'm working with a, we're working with one of our clients right now who is, they came to us, I mean, they're a seven figure business. Um, we work with their management team and some of their salespeople and they're doing really well, but they're on this revenue roller coaster. They've got this offer that is like they piecemealing this offer together. And the reason that they're doing it is because they don't have a way to start conversations with their ideal clients because everything comes in word of mouth and they've tried tons of stuff before none of it's worked only word of mouth has worked for them they've invested a lot of money they were gun shy and i was like guys just come in let's do this we'll do a fun deal make it like make it awesome and uh they jumped in and we worked on their message their positioning first we've helped them build their signature solution which gave them clarity and then structured their offer in a way that they could make a front-end offer that's an easy yes and they have a repeatable model for the back-end process now what's happening is their sales cycles have gone from six to 12 months down to two to four weeks, right? Not only that, but we're creating a repeatable process that the owners don't have to be the ones doing the sales all the time, right? So it's creating freedom for them now with an increase in income, a repeatable process and a repeatable delivery process because now they've got a step-by-step -step approach on how they help the guys get results. It's very difficult to do if you've got you know, 10 different industries that you're working with or 10 vastly different clients that you're working with. It's essentially like trying to build 10 different businesses. You know, folks, I got to tell you, um, operation, no, don't get me wrong, making the first sale is key, right? Making sure that you, like we mentioned, we have a product market fit, but operations after that is so important because, you know, as an entrepreneur, when you're first starting your business, you're jack of all trades, master of none. You're the accountant, you're the marketing, you're the CEO, yep. CMO, the CM, you're all of it, right? Now, once you create operational structure around what you're doing, and, and for now, for example, great example is my, my podcast. Um, when I'm after the show, I'll email Matt, I'll send him a, a, it's a template of the email and say, Hey, this is when your, your show's coming out before here, here, the lecture or here, the questions I'm going to be asking. And even before that, here's the link to schedule the show. And so all these are processes that I put in place to help me being operationally efficient. So I don't have to kind of recreate the will all the time, because if you're constantly having to focus on operations and building and building and building, then you're not scaling. You're, you're, you're actually just kind of running in a circle, uh, chasing your tail. And at the end of the day, if, if your goal is to scale and sell that business, uh, any VC that comes in and looks at your operations and if they're all over the place, don't get me wrong, the entrepreneur is the one that's going to get the interview, but it's the operations that will get the sale. You know? mm -hmm. And you know, it's, a, it's actually, a, uh, listening to you talking there, there's a, there's a piece in here that I want to kind of bring to the table. And this happens a lot with people that come from corporates and then go and start their own businesses. Looking at this and you know, they identify real problems out there and they, they're now like, okay, well, I wanna go and start a business to go and solve these problems. And they think that because I did it in, in my corporate job that it's gonna be easy to do it as an entrepreneur. And they forget that the reason that they, one of the reasons that they were so effective in their corporate job was because they already had a team in place. They already had systems and processes in place. And when you go out and do it in your space self, you got none of that support, right? And that's why that transition phase that we spoke about in the beginning is you don't just stop one and start another, transition over into it. It is the, the best way. It's safe, right? Number one, but obviously you're gonna take some risks anyway. It's safer, let's put it that way. Number two, it helps you to build your business in a more sustainable way. Like I would rather somebody have slow, sustainable growth than a spike and a crash and a spike and a crash. Right? I'd rather that slow upward curve than these crazy ups and downs. Yes, yes, very true. Much much rather have the hockey stick uh, trajectory than anything else. Exactly.
Now, now you've been talking about transitions and, and, you know, trajectories. What does, you know, what does virtual edge look like? What, what is the five-year trajectory for you, for Matt and, and your current business? Yeah. So, uh, you know, for us, we love helping entrepreneurs grow and, uh, you know, we, our mission is we're helping, we want to get this out to as many people as possible. Uh, we are specifically doing how we're doing that is by building everything into automation, into AI, making it readily available to thousands of people around the world. Uh, the big goal, I mean, we use the, the money that we make into, you know, investments and, and you know, we've got a couple of other really exciting projects that we're working on as well. But for us, it's about creating freedom, creating lifestyle, and we want to help our clients to create that freedom and lifestyle as well. Um, you know, we've got some personal goals, we've got some business goals, um, but it's just growth at the maximum, really, for us. And now, who is your ideal client? So if I have folks listening right now, they're like, you know what, I this is I need help generating leads. Who is your ideal client? B2B service providers, uh, business coaches and consultants. We spoke about some of them before. So uh, anyone that's got a, a high ticket offer, uh, so probably medium to high ticket, so probably like 3,000 and above. Some of our clients charge you know, up to $500,000 a year for their services. And they've got a very specific audience that they're looking for. And they, their clients are on LinkedIn. Uh, they're looking for to do professional business with professional people. Uh, that is our ideal client. So either they're in the validating stage where they're trying to figure it out and they need some clarity or they're in the growing stage where they need to get more leads and close more sales or they're in the scaling stage where they've got a team, things are rocking and they want to blow their business up and they're looking for a new channel to do that. So those, that's our ideal client. Nice. And you know, I, folks, I, I feel like you know a lot of people I know don't tend to use LinkedIn very often. And I got to tell you, most of my, from the, from the podcast perspective, most of my leads have come from LinkedIn. Uh, I, I think it's really important. And we talked about product market fit and knowing your customer, but you also have to know where your consumer wants to gain information and what that information exactly. is. So for example, to Instagram. If you're going to use Instagram, they want reels. They want videos. They want content of that nature. Um, entertainment. Facebook, yeah, they want entertainment. Facebook is more groups. When If you want to build a group and talk about value propositions in that group, uh, they don't really want to be posted all over their wall thing. But LinkedIn is, is true. Like, let's network. Let's, let's, what do you, what is your it's a networking platform? Expertise? Yeah. You know, and, and it's, um, I feel it's extremely beneficial, valuable writing newsletters. I, I put blogs on there every once in a while, and it has allowed me to grow professionally and take on, you know, professional speaking opportunities. I'm going to be speaking nationally at a national conference next month in Palm Springs, uh, you know, continuing to grow this, uh, granular, you know, this, this organic brand, which is again, folks, if you're listening, you are the brand. Just want to make sure you know that everything you do, uh, your perception, the way you wear, the way you act, the way everything you do is your brand. And so, uh, just be, re just remember that uh, when you're when you're meeting with people and you're, you're building your presence online, that is in fact your brand. Uh, you know, under promise, over deliver, always. But also figure out a way to create value, right? And and what is what is value? Uh, value is education. Value is um, networking, mentorship, right? All of these things are valuable. What Matt is doing, helping create leads, that is valuable, right? And people will be willing to pay if they find that what you're doing is valuable enough to actually impact them in their lives. They will be, again, I mentioned, they'll reach back to that back pocket and open up that pocketbook and pay for that because of the value. A hundred percent. Now, Matt, we've talked about LinkedIn. What is the best way for you know individuals to get in contact with you? So best way for people to get in contact with me is obviously on LinkedIn. Uh, that is one place where we're very active. So it's Matt Clark Rainmaker. Um, then I mean, you can just email me directly, matt at the virtual edge .com. And uh, yeah, Facebook's the same, Matt Clark Rainmaker. So we're pretty simple and straightforward to get hold of. Uh, love connecting with people, love having people reach out, love starting conversations. You know, for us, it's all about relationships. And if I can help you, I will. 
if I can't help you, I'll point you in the right direction. Um, Cause you just never know, right? It's I'm always under the, uh, you know, we've got a bit of a saying, it's like you're just one relationship away. And I can't tell you how many times I've connected with people. Like I, I just got off a call now with a buddy that I haven't spoken to in a while. And, you know, I've been quite active on, on some of the platforms lately on, on Facebook, we reconnected and, you know, he doesn't need my services, but the people he's connecting me to are amazing. And so I love just connecting with people and seeing where there's opportunities. If there's not cool, you meet someone. If there is great, see what you can do. You know, never waste that opportunity. There is keeping never curious all the time. Yes. There's never a harm in meeting somebody else, uh, learning from their experiences. Cause again, uh, and traveling, I, I always encourage people to travel because the more you travel, mm -hmm. the more you are going to grow individually, you know? Exactly. So you have to, you have to, you have to <laughs> Clark. Thank you so much again for, uh, again, folks, that is virtual edge. This will be on the newsletter. Great time to plug the newsletter. So visit the shades of e.com to subscribe to the newsletter. We will have Matt's information on the newsletter the week before the episode airs the week, the episode airs and the week after you can also follow us on the social channels, LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok at the shades of e, but most importantly, uh, I would say, just sign up for the newsletter because that is the best way to kind of connect with his entrepreneurs. And lastly, if you feel so to do so, a Patreon page, it's $5 a month to be one of our patrons that helps support the podcast and really brings on uh, international guests like Matt onto the show and allows me to continue to do this because again, networking is key. Matt, is there any last words you have to say to the guests before we leave? Yeah, uh, I would just say no matter where you are in, in your journey, uh, just stay curious, you know, and if, if something interests you, go for it. Uh, there's, there's always going to be a risk in everything if you do, right? There's risk in staying at home and sitting on the couch and watching TV, right? The risk you can get fat and get a heart disease or whatever it is, you know, there's risk in going outside and walking across the street. You could get hit by a car or whatever, right? There's risk in absolutely everything that you do. And the only thing I would say is go and take action. If you're curious about it, go and do it, go and take action, go and invest the money, go and play because, you know, you can always make more money, but you'll never get back time. Very, very true. And folks, again, I encourage you be creative, be innovative, color outside the lines. The masterpiece is not in the wall. It's actually within inside of all of us. We just have to bring it out and showcase it to the world. Matt, thank you again so much for the opportunity to interview. I really appreciate it. Go get some rest in Vietnam. Relax, enjoy the time. <laughs> for those folks at home, again, subscribe to the newsletter at theshadesofe.com. Thank you and have a great night.